Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, billers, fillers and champagne swillers, welcome along to the Joe Spivey YouTube channel where we discuss books and little else. And you will forgive me if you can see some veins popping from my neck or uh, some bulging in my eyes, folks. I have been particularly exercised uh, this morning, not by doing any cardiovascular activity, of course, but by uh, responding in time to uh, uh, two videos on YouTube. Um, I've watched one, which was uh, Liz Truss swanning about on the stage of CPAC. She's in America, um, sort of prom promoting an upcoming book, I do believe. And um, she has been just engaging in the most deplorable and maniacal uh, 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 calls about the deep state and about um, how it was that she was, uh, her laughable tenure was curtailed so shortly, blaming, as I say, the deep state, ideologues uh, such as the cabinet secretary, sort of, you know, just, just putting down all of her malfunctions to this just, this, this bizarre, uh, what Keir Starmer has uh, um, sort of consequently called the political wing of the Flat Earth Society, which I thought was jolly very good. Um, but yeah, really, really bizarre thing, telling us that, um, you know, idiotic lefties, left-wing loonies are all after us, rather than the fact that um, she proposed tax cuts without then releasing uh, any, any plans for borrowing. And so every single financial forecaster worth their salt around the world subsequently said, well, we're going to devalue your currency and think that you're not going to be able to pay it back. So, you know, sucks to be you. So Kwarteng and Trust were moved out after about 47 days. But she is in, at CPAC now, telling everybody that Farage is great and, you know, probably straddling Donald Trump for all I'm aware. Um, and also we have um, a new video by Trigonometry, um, hosted by two individuals, one Constantine Kissin, who seems to be to be, um, you know, a, a, a perfectly, um, you know, a, a, a perfectly conscientious man who, you know, a little bit liberal minded, uh, open to discuss very many things. And there's a, also a failed and chirpy uh, comedian next to him, uh, whose name I, I can't even remember. But they had Suella Bradman on and... Um, all three of them, as far as I'm aware, have eyes and ears and larynxes and take on nutrients and comestibles every day and presumably go to the toilet and, um, you know, have some, some, some uh, 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 effluence come from their, their rectums. So they're human beings, they're definitely humans, but three of them were in the room at the same time and they could not come to a conclusion, or they, they, they could not think of one reason why it was in the United Kingdom's interest to remain in and bound by the European Court of Human Rights. They could not think of one reason why it was great to be in there. Nothing about uh, religious freedom or, um, you know, sort of mitigating against torture or freedom of movement or any other such um, observably excellent things that we should be bound by. They all want to leave the European Court of Human Rights now, folks. Um, so that was a pretty dangerous chat. It was uh, um, a very, very easy interview that, if you'll allow me to analogize, using the cricket analogy, um, they, were, they were sort of sending a few easy ones down and Suella Braverman was just slapping them through the covers for four runs every single time. Um, so that's, as well you can tell, I've rambled on about that for three minutes, so that's uh, not very good. But um, yes, we are back today, as I'm sure this title will inform you, with a bookshelf tour. Uh, we're not actually looking at my bookshelves as we once did. That studio, I've had to rent that studio out to uh, a bunch of Italians who want to um, take pictures of themselves in the nude, but that's jolly well fine. It means I've got a decent income. Um, so yes, I I've actually just taken them from the bookshelf, deposited them here, and I'm going to show you them now. Um, I do always <laughs> remark at um, the, the essential bookshelves are, in my experience, essentially an excellent refutation of um, conspiracy theorists. I would love to take David Icke and his, um, you know, sort of just dim-witted mob down to my bookshelf and show them just how hard it is to control one shelf of books, of 28 books, let alone um, an oblate spheroid, which is 25,000 miles around, which is peopled by 7 billion inhabitants. Um, Control is very difficult, folks. I think we've, we've arrived at this. But anyway, um, so let's get on with the bookshelf talk. First up, we have, uh, I may have shown this before, but I don't think I have. This is uh, The Only Living Witness, the true story of serial sex killer Ted Bundy. Uh, and because of um, England's, at the moment, seeming, or, or at least um, jittering young girls' proclivity towards true crime, uh, Mr Bundy saw himself, or didn't see himself, he's long since dead, but, but was the subject and the main headline of a Netflix series, The Ted Bundy Tapes. Um, and he's, he's pretty, pretty prominent in this country now, in the minds of, of psychologists and students alike. Um, this is by Stephen Michard and Hugh Ainsworth. They, were, they both featured in the documentary as well. Um, and this is, again, reasonable. It's, it's very informative, very insightful and exciting. Relies, of course, on its subject matter, but isn't typically well written because um, 
the craft of writing and um, stylistic sort of eloquence and all that is um, a much neglected virtue these days. Um, and so people just want to, to just smash information onto the page without thinking about how to properly put it together. But yes, that's The Only Living Witness uh, by yeah, Michaud and, Haines and Ainsworth. Um, we are in the M's, the O's, the M's, the N's, the O's and the P's today. Folks, we've got quite a lot to get through. So this might be quite long, so get yourselves a cup of tea and um, or, or whatever beverage libation it is you enjoy. Uh, next up, I've shown this in the channel in a recent book uh, uh, book haul, but I'm going to go through it again. This is Dominic Midgley and Chris Hutchins' Abramovich, the billionaire from nowhere. He is, of course, most famous for being um, an apparatchik of uh, Vladimir Putin. He's a great friend, I think known as Mr. A in the Kremlin, or was until recently a great friend of Mr. Putin's, and um, essentially just refused to disavow him for his illegal war in Ukraine, and as a result um, was hit with very many economic sanctions here in the West. Um, he was the owner and um, just general talisman, in fact, especially economic and financial talisman, of my uh, favourite football team, uh, Chelsea Association Football Club. Uh, Stamford Bridge is their ground, and he um, brought into being what was then dubbed by the fans as the Roman Empire. Gave us lots of money, got us some great players, and um, essentially sports washed, um, much like the Saudi Arabians and the Middle East like to do now. Um, but yeah, he was, he was the originator of sports washing, I would say. Um, so yes, this is... Um, I haven't read it as of yet, with a new explosive chapter. This looks rather old and it's definitely second-hand, so um, it's probably going to be slightly outdated and could do with an update. But yes, that's uh, Abramovich, the billionaire from nowhere. Pos uh, he, he profited from the uh, loans for shares scheme, I do believe, in, um, in Russia in the 90s. Next up we have a, a thing I've long since forgotten about. This is Kenzuki's Kingdom by Michael Marpergo, illustrated by Michael Foreman. The, uh, this was a winner of the Children's Book Award. I, was, I re remember reading this in year five and six when I was nine and ten and really enjoying it. The story of a, a shipwrecked Westerner who finds himself in the hands of a self-reliant bearded uh, uh, member of sort of, a, you know, an indigenous archipelago and um, yeah, he's helped to it by that. Uh, I can't really remember. Obviously, Morpurgo has done War Horse uh, and is very successful because of that. But um, yeah, I don't know whether I'll read this. I'll probably certainly be reading it to my children in five and ten years time. Um, can you believe, folks, 27 and 28, Joe Spivey is... Um, positing offspring, but there we are. Um, so yes, uh, Kenzuki's Kingdom, Michael Morpurgo. I'm sure the writing's plain and digestible, um, but I'm sure the story has got some, some weight to it. Uh, next up we have Douglas Murray, The Madness of... Uh, not The Madness of Crowds, that's what he has written. Um, but this is The Strange Death of Europe by Douglas Murray. This is a very, very weird cover, as I'm sure you can tell. Um, and again, this links very heavily with what I was mentioning earlier with Suella Braverman, folks. Um, Douglas Murray is somebody with whom I find most often that I agree with when he pincers um, the, the, the blue-haired, you know, latte-swilling wokerati and the um, intolerant mobs and all of, that, all of this. But uh, my, uh, our, our views on uh, mass legal mass legal migration differ greatly. Um, he seems to think that the offspring of uh, immigrants from Turkey and from Libya and from Pakistan and from um, where else? Uh, 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 Romania and Lithuania. He seems to think that the children of those people, not just those people arriving, but the children of those people who have been born in Britain and have had just as many pork pies and bacon sandwiches and sung just as many national anthems and made as many cups of tea as myself and other you know, white British people are fundamentally un-British and aren't British. Um, and that's pretty much what he eventually goes on to say in this book and talks about cultural fibre and how different cultures are coming in here and, and destroying the um, sort of Western Judeo-Christian fundament of our existence. They can never actually give a def decent definition of what that is apart from freedom of speech. Um, so yes, this is nice. Uh, Douglas Murray, he needs to calm down, I think. He's, he's, he's really rather a little bit much at the moment. He's, um, he's caught a bit of the Petersonian flu, I think, and wants to be a little bit attention-seeking and... Um, it just creates needless animus and is of, of, all the time on Piers Morgan and, you know, he's just, he's just becoming very slowly distasteful as a result of bi-directional digital media's desire to sensationalise every political viewpoint and news story. So, come on, Douglas, if, ha if heaven forbid you are watching this video, just smarten up a bit, mate. See the light, calm down, all's going to be fine. Uh, <laughs> next up we have, uh, as I'm sure you can tell by the front cover, uh, Legionnaire by Simon Murray. Uh, my five years in the French Foreign Legion, I believe, is the subtitle. This was given to me, I've never read this before, this was given to me by my uh, 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 dear father. This is Grand Viceroy Spivey's um, favourite book, I believe. Um, he, he, he's had many jobs in his past, 
um, but he currently works in and around schools. And when they did a, that sounds paedophilic, doesn't it? My father works in and around school. He's employed by an academy to work. He doesn't just spend most of his time raking leaves in a wheelbarrow. But um, yeah, when, when they had, when they do that usual round of stuff whereby they have to, they, they um, ask some of the staff about their favorite books and what they recommend the children reading. This is what Stephen brought up. Uh, uh, yeah, Simon Murray, my five years in the French Foreign Legion. It's um, supposed to be uh, a memoir about the toughness required and the, the severity of the training methods and the brutality of everything that he went through, um, you know, in, in the French Foreign Legion, which is, I think, supposedly uh, meant to be harder to get into than the, 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 the Royal Marines commandos and the SEALs in America, supposedly, or at least it was when, when Murray was operating. But we've got maps of uh, northern Algeria. Um, so, yes, that's Legionnaire. I suppose I should get to it at some point, given that Stephen loves it. Uh, next up, we have uh, a whole swath of uh, Nabokov. We have Lolita. Um, uh, Lolita, light of my life, fire of my loins, my sin, my soul, Lolita, as it very famously begins. Um, something that I absolutely adored when I was a, a complete, um, uh, you know, unapologetic sort of aestheticist when I was very young, when I didn't care about rudiments of plot or twists and turns, and I just wanted to be bamboozled by brilliant writing. Um, but it's a bit, this now, have, having read it two or three times, I, I think I may have even called this my favourite book for some months, um, it's just, it's, it's a little bit, uh, it calls attention to itself really rather too much and obviously deals with um, a, um, a, what he calls a, a, a nymph who is the Lolita, who is, uh, whose name is I think Charlotte Hayes, or sorry, Dolores Hayes, Charlotte Hayes is the mother, and an attractive, uh, 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 sort of just, just quite muscly and, um, you know, sort of prepossessing uh, uh, male from Europe who comes across and um, essentially forces that young girl into some uh, discreet sexual acts and then chases after a playwright who takes her as well. Uh, but it's all, obviously far too many people focus on the actual contents of the book, uh, sorry, sorry, on the um, um, literal contents of the book rather than the, the stylistic brilliance of it. I think it is really entertaining still to this day and it never fails to uh, make me smile in turn. Sometimes it's a bit pathetic, sometimes it's a bit uh, yeah, just a bit sort of childish, and it's 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 there at your knees, sort of you know, sort of, sort of clawing at you and throwing bits at you and wanting your attention all of the time and wanting you to to like the book and wanting you to underline stuff. It's very self contrived, but yeah, that's, that's Lolita, um, which shot Nabokov to fame. Next up, we have something I have not read. Um, this is again, as you can tell by the title, that's awfully done. Uh, this is Mary, the first novel by the author of Lolita and Arda. Apparently, this is the first novel he wrote. Uh, it seems very basic at the start. Goodness me, look how orange that is in there. What is that? That could well be um, sort of intergalactic sputum there. That could be anything, folks. Um, but yeah, this is a very, very short thing. I, there is no blurb or anything, so I can't describe it to you. Uh, next up, we have something that I, again, that I enjoyed. It's a nice, slim thing. Good introduction to Nabokov. This is, I think it's pronounced Penin, uh, presumably. Uh, Professor Timothy Penin, previously of Tsarist Russia, is now precariously perched at the heart of an American campus. Battling with American life and language, Penin must face great hazards in this new world. The ruination of his beautiful lumber room as office, the removal of his teeth and the fitting of new ones, the search for a suitable boarding house, and the trials of taking the wrong train to deliver a lecture in a language he is yet to master. So you can see there, a little bit like Bello, Nabokov failed to ever write anything that wasn't uh, essentially centred around his own lifestyle. Um, he, 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 you know, the, the, the Russian emigre that goes on to Princeton or Harvard or whatever to teach literature and give a lecture on Kafka, and, and Lepidoptery, most of his most of the, his fiction concerns protagonists that are invariably very very much or inextricably uh, inextricable from Vladimir Nabokov himself. But yeah, decent writing nonetheless. And then my favourite one of all, um, but again not something that I would cheer nowadays, but something that I have fond memories about. This is Pale Fire, again all in modern uh, Penguin Modern Classics. Again, they're very very short. They'll take you you know two or three days. I would highly recommend you go to them because you may well get something out of it. If you've never read Nabokovian prose before, you'll either be annoyed or enthralled or enamoured, um, but I, I would certainly recommend it if you're somebody who doesn't read complex prose all of the time, you know, somebody that doesn't read um, sort of quite complex prose, if you know what I mean, if, 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 if you read airport thrillers all of the time and it's she went to the shop, she did this, they did that, which have their place and are, are uh, very sort of narratorially interesting. For somebody that just view, that, that, that rather view, you, you will probably uh, enjoy and yeah, find this very, very exciting. Um, it's a long poem that 
the um, the surviving friend of a, of a deceased professor narrates um, and is yeah again very 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 nice very very entertaining. There's not an awful lot of point to it. You don't really know what to think at the end of a Nabokov novel often. Um, but yes, this is uh, the American poet John Shade is dead, murdered. His last poem, Pale Fire, is put into a book together with a preface, a lengthy commentary, and notes by Shade's editor Charles Kinboat, uh, known as the campus as the Great Beaver. Kinboat is haughty, inquisitive, intolerant, but he is also mad, bad, and even dangerous. I wonder who on earth that is, that's invoking. But yes, uh, there is Mr. Nabokov uh, indeed, uh, a very, very old man by the time he was six, or at least uh, uh, aging man by the time he was famous and uh, notorious. And um, yes, yeah, so that's him. Uh, there's, there's a front cover there with uh, an, an old style. That's a mobile phone, folks, before they were on screens. Um, they were sort of wired up to the wall, I believe. Yes, yeah, so that's Pale Fire. The final thing from Mr. Nabokov is Think, Write and Speak. This is, there is him, Stu Pine, uh, writing on his bed, doing his best impression of Joe Spivey writing reviews. Um, so this is, yeah, edited by Brian Boyd and Anastasia Tolstoy, who has to be related to the great writer, I believe. Um, this was 12.99 originally. Yeah, so this is uh, some of his non-fiction, essentially. Some of his stuff about his time in Cambridge. Some of his, comp what else have we got? I, I've, I've broken the book, actually. Uh, so feverishly did I dissect it. Uh, we've got Cambridge, we've got stuff on Rupert Brooke, we've got on poetry, we've got... Uh, Man and Things, we've got uh, a load of Russian writers I've never heard of before, um, Alexei Remizov, um, what else have we got? Interviews, oh yeah, so there are um, uh, 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 minutes of his interviews written down, uh, oh, so many interviews, goodness me, interview, 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 Mr. Nabokov's acceptance speech, interview with George Pfeiffer, um, so yeah, Nabokov, famous, I mean, think, write, speak, this uh, is a hearkening back to uh, his ability, his, his statement that he thinks like a genius, writes like a distinguished author, and speaks like a child. He was apparently unable to do what I am uh, uh, so prominent for on YouTube, which is just to ramble on and extemporise to one's heart's content. Um, he, whenever he is, he ha you'll notice there are many interviews available on YouTube. He will have a, um, he'll have a, uh, a script there pre-written that he will constantly refer to. He is not able to, to think of uh, observations um, on the spare of the moment, apparently, or was not able to do so, apparently. Um, so there, that, 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 that just about covers my uh, a bit of Nabokov. There are more books that I wanted to show you, but I'm going to have to uh, wait. Uh, I'm going to have to sort of deprive you of that for just for a little while, a little bit of philosophy and a little bit of poetry that I can always go into next week or in another video. Um, so just a quick announcement, any of you guys that aren't, uh, or any of you guys that are still here, that are still slaving away and still uh, uh, sort of trodding through the quagmire of Spivanian uh, rambunctiousness. Um, I am now a, a, a syndicated book reviewer, I want to call it. Um, our great friend, uh, patron pariah, and sort of just, um, sort of, I don't know, erstwhile father figure on YouTube, uh, Steve Donoghue, has, um, for his sins, commissioned a review of mine to uh, appear in Open Letters Review, which I'll probably link down below. It's on uh, Peter Pomerantsev's upcoming book, um, how to Win an Information War, The Propagandist Who Outwitted Hitler. Um, and I give it not much of a, not necessarily a pasting, but I um, talk about its negatives and its positives, and um, hopefully it's a lively, enthralling, and entertaining review for you guys. Um, it's my first foray into this type of thing. I have written stuff before, but, but never has it been taken so seriously by an industry veteran. Um, so yes, that's going to be down below. And um, yeah, I, I've written another one since, which probably is due to come out and... I'm getting review copies hand over fist every day from um, prospective publishers. So yes, here I start, the James Wood, a Missian journey of Joe Spivey uh, to the pages of The Guardian, The New Statesman, and um, where else the TLS is about to start. So yes, I hope I haven't been, I haven't, I haven't prevaricated too much. I hope I haven't wandered and meandered too much, folks. And um, yes, I've, I've, sl I've, I've uh, changed the angle slightly so that I'm directly facing the windows. You can see uh, uh, Mother's cocktail cabinet in the background there. Uh, many a gin has been poured on the shelves. Um, so yes, I'm going to end this video just short of 20 minutes here, folks, and thank you ever so much for watching BookTube, and say goodbye.